So today we continue with our journey through the Gospel of John, and we are starting at chapter two. And we've been journeying through the Gospel of John, and we've taken a few weeks over the first, you know, several uh, several sections of text. Uh, but today we arrive at chapter two in the first of seven miraculous signs, and it is the turning of water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana. Just thought I should have a little prop here as we uh, let's go through today's message. So there it is. Uh, wedding feast again, and actually, I, I got to admit, just like right off the top, this is the, one of the most famous uh, miracles of Jesus. Right? You talk to people who don't even know anything about, you know. Christianity much other than some of the things of Jesus and you know they don't go to church or anything and you ask them hey can you maybe relate to me what are some of the miracles that Jesus did and it's like walking on water and turning water into wine is always on that list I remember talking to one guy and he said uh, he said you know I can really get behind this Jesus guy someone who turns the water into wine <laughs> and he just that that to him was was enough to compel him to maybe look in a bit more about this person of Jesus Mind you, he also tend to neglected all the things Jesus said about self-control. But anyway, to him, this was, <laughs> this was evidence to him that maybe, you know, maybe Jesus was this life of the party, you know, in his own certain way of thinking. Um, actually, when I was telling Jen about the text for this week, uh, we kind of have this funny interchange. And you know how we song in the, sang in the kids' time, uh, um, One More Step Along the World I Go. Um, Jen's like, you know, one of the verses could be, um, what, what did you say? Somebody, it was... It was uh, Give me wine in my glass, keep it pouring. You know, we thought, yeah, <laughs> we thought, yeah, that that would fit actually with this song, although it might confuse a lot of people. So let's not maybe put it in there. Um, anyway, so it is so so popular, and as I said, it's one of the seven signs, miraculous signs in the Gospel of John. And so uh, what that means is a sign is a miracle, but it's intended to point us to some greater reality. And so you think of a road sign. So a road sign tells you about what town you're coming into or the population or what the speed limit is. So a sign, as it is used in the Gospel of John, is meant to point us to some greater reality about God that glorifies God or shows us some incredible insight about who he is and the kind of work he does in the world. And so this is one of seven powerful signs. Now, I want to say a few words about miracles before we get into the text today. Because let's just be honest, miracles can sometimes be a stumbling block for people. In, in these modern times, right? A lot of people haven't seen a miracle. At least they don't think they have seen a miracle. I know some of you have because I've talked to you about it. Um, but a lot of people haven't. And so they're, they're kind of skeptical. And so it just doesn't fit if we can't quantify it and measure it. And if it's not uh, predictably repeatable, it just doesn't fit into the schema of what is or isn't real. So some people have that bias. Uh, other people, and I would warn against this, some people look back at these ancient peoples and they're like, you know what, way back then they weren't very smart and they, it was kind of pre-scientific era and so they were more susceptible to things and they didn't look into stuff. So something incredible happened and they just, they just assumed it was a miracle before looking at all the details. I just want us to warn, want to warn us of that because I really do think it's a kind of modern arrogance that we project backwards, right? These people would have been just as wowed at these incredible events as us today, and they valued reason just like we value reason today, okay? So think of it, 2,000 years from now, in the future, if the world's around, and I'm not sure it will be, people are going to look back in our day and say, well, <laughs> what pre-scientific Neanderthals Right, because we're going to keep learning and stuff. And so I think we also have a, I need to have the same amount of respect looking back at these people. They would have been wowed at these incredible things. And also, they valued reason just like us. Here's something else. When we look at miracles in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, we think, wow, that is this incredible thing has happened. And it's a break in the natural order of things. Right? Bible scholar N.T. Wright puts a bit of a different spin on it. He says, no, it's not a break in the natural order of things. It's the restoration of the natural order of things. So when Jesus turns water into wine or he, you know, casts a demonic spirit out of somebody or he heals someone or something else, this isn't a break in the natural order of things. It's the restoration of the God-ordained order of things. And so God, the world God made was wonderful and beautiful and great and blissful and then brokenness and sin and darkness came into the world, messed everything up. So Jesus comes onto the scene. All of a sudden there's this cluster and rise in the percentage of this miraculous activity around the Son of God appearing in flesh. And when he does these things, it's a restoration of things. So they anticipate and help us to look forward and, and look forward to that great day in the future when everything will be made new and like this all the time, right? The new heavens and the new earth where we live in perfect obedience and we live in the very presence and glory of God. It's amazing. So this is all an anticipation of what things will be like. 
Okay, so with some of that background in mind, we're going to jump into the text, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Uh, if you've got your Bibles and you want to open them up, that is great. Follow along, and the words will be on the screen if you don't have them. On the third day, and that's the third day after the previous encounter with Nathaniel that we talked about last week, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. So this kind of sets the scene. So let's set the scene together. So uh, a wedding. Now, when we hear a word wedding, what we do as modern readers is we think, okay, what do I know about a wedding today? Oh, weddings then must have been similar. And there were some similarities, but there are a lot of big differences as well. So let me highlight a few of them. Today we think of two individuals falling in love and people coming together to celebrate that, right? Well, in the ancient world, it was two families coming together. And these two families had a lot to say about who got married and who didn't get married. And it was kind of this mutual agreement, these two families coming together uh, out of security to support one another, to secure their future. You wanted a good match in the families. As such, it was a very public display. It was a public event, usually involved everyone in the village. And your honor as a family was very much on display. And honor was very important in this world, much more than it is today. Honor is having a certain social status. It's having a certain reputation. And if you lost your honor, if you lost that family reputation, it could be disastrous. Bring ruin to the family business. You know, you could recover to a certain degree, but sometimes not always and not fully. And so this was a big deal. This is an honorable event. The families are coming together. And it was something that involved everyone in the village. The women in the village would spend days getting all the decorations together. Uh, it would last quite often up to a week. This is a long time. Uh, when the bride was ready, they would process her by, you know, holding torches, going in front of her, leading her to singing songs. And many of the guests, before they showed up, would send wine ahead of time to ensure that the celebration would be happening and would be, would be merry and everything else. So a lot of details. You really want this to be going well. So this is the wedding. And it's in Cana. So where was biblical Cana? Um, uh, archaeological evidence is kind of divided on this. There's a few competing locations. It's probably Kirbet Cana, which is about 13 kilometers north of Nazareth. Jesus' mother was there, so you get the sense that, that Mary is the primary guest. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding, so you get the sense that they're kind of add-ons. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. And so here is the moment of crisis. Remember I said if all of a sudden went, something went wrong, something could bring disgrace to the honor of the families? This was one of those things. Now, if we were at a wedding today, and like, the bar went dry. People might be upset, some people more than others perhaps, but this is nothing compared to the shame that would have happened in the ancient world. Church Father Hilary of Poitiers describes the scene like this. The bridegroom would have been anxious, the household in confusion, and the harmony of the marriage feast would have been imperiled. Okay. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. Pause. So, this is one of those passages where we look at it and say, wait a second, Jesus sounds like he's being rude, right? This is like the only place in the New Testament where Jesus kind of sounds like Archie Bunker, okay? Um, by the way, I don't know if you've seen one of those episodes recently. They are not politically correct, any one of my friends. Um, anyway, but what we need to know here, the oldest manuscripts are in Greek, and this is a translation issue. So the word here is just the standard word for an adult female. So it's, there's no disrespect in Jesus' voice. This is, if it sounds like it, it's because something gets lost in translation. Why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not. So through the Gospel of John, when Jesus talks about his hour or his time, it's really a reference to his, the time of his glorification when he starts to suffer and he goes to the cross and, and, and that Everything to do with that and with the, with the resurrection, it's the big grand event through which God will bring salvation to the world. So that's what his hour is. And so as you go through the gospel, what you see is that Jesus is only revealing certain bits at a certain time, okay? A according to a, a kind of a schedule, right? And that's what he will re uh, reveal in his own time. And so that's what's going on here. And the wine has run out. So Mary knows something's going on and she's bringing it to Jesus' attention. Uh, recall Psalm 104, God makes wine to gladden the heart. And so wine was very often used in these celebrations. Um, but of course, we can't say that and not note also that in the New Testament, especially, um, there, is, uh, there are many warnings against intoxication, drinking too much. And part of the reason for that is because we are to have um, clarity of thought. We are to be ready. We are to be alert. The New Testament puts a high premium on alertness. We want to have integrity as disciples and to be disciples. And so if your judgment is impaired, you obviously can't do that very well. Uh, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. 
Like, she knows he's special. He knows, she knows he can do incredible things, right? You know that song we sing at Christmas, Mary, did you know? Of course she knew. Mary, did you know that your baby? Yes, Mary, did you know? Yes, he did, right? She knew all the prophecies. She knew he's a savior. He knows son of, the God, son of God most high. So she knew. And so it's like she's like saying to the servants, hey, something's going to happen. Something's afoot. Pay attention to what this guy says. Verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. Okay, I just want us to pause and do the math for a second, right? Because this isn't just like a glass or a goblet. Like, what are we talking about here? Remember, this is a huge feast. A lot of people from the village are here, maybe all of them. And this is happening over multiple days, perhaps up to a week. Okay, so let's do the math. So between 20 and 30 gallons, so let's assume an average of 25. Let's switch it to liters. We are talking about 568 liters of wine. That's a lot. Okay, so if you want a visual, visual a little bit, here, here's, here's standard kind of 750 milliliter bottle of wine, okay? So that would be 738 bottles of wine that he makes. Wow, that's a lot, okay? And this is good quality wine here, okay? So this is, Laura and I don't have expensive tastes, um, but this is uh, J. Lore. So we bought this, actually it's a gift for someone, we haven't given it to them yet, but it's a prop this morning. And this is not brought to you by J. Lore. They paid no money to have this here. Uh, this was like $30 or something ar around there, which for us is like, oh, that's, that's pretty fancy. Right? Um, this would be nothing compared to the quality. Of, it's not like some you know, swashbuckling homebrew made by an amateur. If God can make the heavens and the earth, he's going to make a vintage beyond anything we can ever imagine on our own, right? So this is an amazing, amazing feat. We, we are to think extravagance, okay? Extravagance here. So <clears throat> then he told them, now draw out some out some and take it to the master of the banquet. So this is like the steward or the, the MC, right? They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Now, what's the logic? There, why? Well, it's amazing. Like he's he's acknowledging what has gone on, and this is obviously the best wine. Now, why would people serve good wine early and the cheap wine later? Well, it's because people's taste buds have been dulled over time, right? Um, think of Uncle Joe at the wedding. If you are any of you are an Uncle Joe, I'm sorry, I don't mean you. Uh, but early, you know, he's kind of behaving himself earlier in the evening, and then after a couple of drinks, he's saying some things that he probably shouldn't later on, right? And so the idea is, just with the more consumption, your judgment is impaired, in the same way your taste buds are impaired. But here, what happens is, is the good stuff is coming out later, which gives honor and dignity to the groom for how he is treating his guests, which is in a very good way. Of course, we know it's not him. We know it's Jesus. You have saved the best till now. Verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, his majesty. This is the wow factor. And his disciples believed in him. Now, when it says they believed him, it doesn't mean that they didn't believe in him before. What it means is this confirmed and strengthened and built up their belief. And we all know from our own journeys is that when you come to that point, yeah, you know what? I actually believe that Jesus is who he says he was. You have this personal and authentic, genuine trust. It doesn't mean that you have this incredibly strong faith, faith all of a sudden, maybe for some people. But for a lot of people, it grows over time, right? It's like what happens is like you have a conversation with so-and-so. You start to study the Bible. You join a small group. God does something in your life, and you get built up. And so the same thing is happening with these disciples here. And I think if we were there in our dresses and our fancy clothes and everything else, what would happen? We, we would also be wowed. Call your best friend. Call the news station. This is amazing. We would also have blown minds. After this, they went down to Capernaum, which is another fishing village, with his mother and brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. And we end the text there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So remember that a sign is meant to point our attention to some greater reality, like a divine road sign, so to speak. So what is our attention brought to in this story? Well, certainly Jesus as Messiah, he's the center. Is it supposed to bring our attention to the fact that, <laughs> that Jesus is, is glory, is magnificent? Yes. Is it meant to bring our attention to the fact that he is the long-awaited Messiah? Yes. Is it meant to bring our attention to, uh, to the fact that in Christ, God is bringing his light and life in a new, unique way? Yes, absolutely. 
Is it meant to bring our attention to the great feast and wedding in the future? The great marriage celebration one day. The marriage of heaven and earth where the holy city will come down and God will dwell personally with his people. There will be no mourning or crying or death or pain. Because the old order of things has passed away. Where there will be no death, mourning, cancer, heart disease, innocent children, ambulances, hospitals. And where the celebration will be the celebration to end all celebrations. To start all celebrations. Is it meant to make us anticipate and think about that? Yes, it is. So Jesus is clearly at the center of this story. But over to the side, there is someone whose life has been changed. He has been saved. He has been brought from disgrace to dignity. Who was it? The groom. His life has been totally changed by this story. Now, remember that honor is a very, very big deal in the ancient world. High status, reputation. You lose that like running out of wine at a wedding feast, which is a public display of honor for the whole community. Two families coming together. And if anything goes wrong, it could bring ruin to yourself and to your family for a very long time. That's the world that we are talking about. And Jesus saves him from disgrace. Now, one of the many things this story teaches us is this, is that the source and security of our dignity is Christ our King. The source and security of our dignity is Christ our King. So let's unpack this a little bit. So why is it our source? Well, think about the phrase, okay? Let's follow it. Jesus is called the Messiah. What does that mean in Hebrew? It means anointed one. It refers to God's chosen King and representative on the earth. And so if he is the King and we belong to him, we are his royal subjects and the royal pedigree is shared with us. So all of a sudden, he gives us that dignity. He gives us that status. He gives us that honor. So the source is from our king. The source and security of our dignity is Christ our king. We have that royal pedigree. That's the source of it. Now, why is that also our security? It means that the one who gives it to us is stronger than anyone who wants to take it away from us. Think of someone who wants to take away that dignity that you have, that honor that, that is your right as a child of God. Every single one of those people is weaker than our king. And that's why it is secure. Now, part of the reason I think this is a timely message is because many people are on shaky mental and emotional ground. I heard this term for the first time this past week, the spiral of exhaustion. The spiral of exhaustion. And friends, let me tell you this. When you're exhausted, you start to doubt yourself. You start to question your identity. You become more susceptible to untruth. You make a mistake and then you beat yourself up. I'm such an idiot. Someone accuses you of something. Maybe you lose your job. I know some of you have. Maybe you say the wrong thing and all of a sudden you're on the outs with other people who, who liked you before. You go online and get sucked into that comparison trap. Ugh. You try to do better, even to be faithful, but then you miss the mark and you shame yourself. Or like the groom in the story, you don't plan well and you let people down time and time again. And you let them down in such a way that it impacts other people's lives as well. You start to think that God would never notice a silly simpleton like you. And when we are exhausted, we start to doubt ourselves, we start to question who we are, and we become more susceptible to untruth. To that, the Word of God says, no. The source and security of our dignity is Christ our King. Here's some food for thought which expresses the urgency of this lesson from John 2. Courtney Morton, Martin writes, so many perfect girls were raised entirely without organized religion, and the majority of the rest of us experienced spirituality only in the form of mandatory holiday services with a big-haired grandmother. Overlay our darth of spiritual exploration with our excess of training in ambition, and you have a generation of godless girls raised largely without a fundamental sense of divinity. In fact, our worth in the world has always been tied to our looks, not the amazing miracle of existence. 
Here's another example. There's a generation of young boys and men being raised right now. Many of them are give, being given the impression that because they are male, they are bad and evil. Every day, the message, the message, the message. How do you think that's going to go? Or there's a whole group of people struggling with various mental health issues, and although we rejoice that some of the stigma has been taken away, a lot of it still remains, and people who struggle in various ways think that they are somehow a disgrace to the people around them, and they're just a drag on everyone's time, attention, and energy, and they're not sure that they're worth it. And then there's people of all ages bombarded by a confusing time being labeled as this or that in their lives, and they start to, over that time, start to wonder deep down, if not, maybe some of those labels are true. Failure. Mistake. Phony. Hypocrite. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, has a good word about that. Don't rely too much on labels, for too often they are fables. One of the great insights that New York Times best-selling author Tim Keller says about Christian identity, who we are. It's not the junk that the world tries to shove down our throats. He says, a Christian's identity is received, not achieved. It's a gift that he gives to us. The source and security of our dignity is Christ, our King. I'd like you to do something for this coming week. Please do it with me. It's a little kind of project. Every time you look at yourself in the mirror, maybe it's the bathroom mirror, maybe it's that little mirror that drops down in your car, maybe it's something on your phone, maybe it's a mirror at the end of the hall, I don't know, whatever, the bathroom at work. Every time you see yourself in the mirror, I want you to whisper a word, and that word is dignity. Dignity. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, uh, the Holocaust survivor, reflected on the idea of identity in a Nazi concentration camp. This is what he writes. The majority of prisoners suffered from a kind of inferiority complex. We had all had once been or had fancied ourselves to be somebody. But we were treated like complete non-entities. But, he goes on, the consciousness of one's inner value is anchored in higher, more spiritual things and cannot be shaken by camp life. But how many free men and women, let alone prisoners, possess it? Brothers and sisters, you and I possess it because Jesus gives it to us. He takes that groom from disgrace to dignity just as he does for you and me. Praise be to God. Amen.